Thank you, thank you, Barry, and thank you, Louise, as well. Uh, you all can hear me okay, yes, everyone? Perfect. Thank you so much, and it's a real delight to talk about this topic, because I don't think this is one that has been uh, meaningfully studied over the years. So I'm, I'm actually, I, I was excited to do some research on this. Uh, I'd had some of my own information over the years, so I'm eager to share what I have. So uh, does anyone recognize where this location is of this title page here? Anyone? That's the Carlson building there. Did anyone see it there at the corner of Front and Cross? So we're going to get to this wreck in 1941 in a little bit. But first, let me just give you a quick background on who I am. Uh, I've lived in Wheaton now for almost 50 years. It's 48 years. I went to local schools here and stayed in Illinois for college. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I write for the Chicago Tribune. I've covered Wheaton uh, for many, many years as well, off and on. But I'm a huge aficionado of Wheaton history. So I often give talks about local history. Above, you can see some of the more recent ones I've done. I did the great fires of Wheaton not long ago, so I'm clearly fast becoming Wheaton's disaster expert. Um, and I talked about women of not notable women in Wheaton's history. I talked about, I gave the 9-11 Remembrance Ceremony speech almost a year ago now, and I talked about Margie Hamilton, Wheaton's first female mayor. Uh, I'm also, as, this isn't as widely known, I'm also a major rail fan myself. Not so much a model railroader, but I actually follow the industry really closely. So my favorite railroads have been the Chicago and Northwestern, which came through Wheaton, the Elgin Joliet and Eastern, which slices through West Chicago, and when I was a kid, anything I could see on the old Great Western up in Carroll Stream. Many of you remember that line as well. So as I concluded here, the Wheaton area is not a bad place to live if you like trains. So why give this talk? So Wheaton and this broader area have had a colorful history with railroads, not just having trains coming through here, but actually a meaningful number of train wrecks over the years. And again, as I said earlier, I don't think this has been meaningfully examined before, so it's an opportunity to, to unearth some colorful stories. So blessedly, very few of the wrecks that have happened in Wheaton over the years have caused fatalities, but there have been a whole heap of messes. I mean, all kinds of mess. But the other thing is, people like train crashes, right? There's the movie The Fugitive. Who remembers that, right? They spent a million dollars on a train crash. I know because I watched it again last night on YouTube. You see Harrison Ford trying to get out of the way. But also, not just The Fugitive, but in the movie Unstoppable. Does anyone know that film? came out in 2010, and Silver Streak from 1976, one of my favorites. But it's also a topic, train crashes, train wrecks have been in the news a lot lately. Can anyone guess why? Look at the Norfolk Southern derailment in Ohio in February, remember that? This is, pretty, this is pretty horrifying, right? Look at those plumes of smoke. Do you remember what the railroad did? They decided to burn off the remaining hazardous chemicals in place. Everyone thought, what on earth were they doing with that? I still don't understand that. So I want to talk a little bit about wrecks, but here's what I don't want to talk so much about. I don't want to talk about train pedestrian incidents. These are often fatal and tragic, but they usually don't involve derailments. Um, and again, there's an emphasis on the tragic side. For the same reason, I don't, I don't want to talk so much about train vehicle incidents. Wheaton's had a long history, as every community has, of people going around crossing gates. Not a good idea, uh, but generally I've decided to stay away from those. Um, and then I decided also to stay away from wrecks and collisions that took place too far afield from Wheaton. So one that you all may uh, be well familiar with, as a result, downtown Naperville on the left and in the center there, that's the 1946 Naperville train disaster. It killed 45 people. It injured 125. Nor, on the lower right-hand side, there was a Downers Grove train wreck. Pretty colorful story. Killed three. Uh, we have enough in Wheaton to talk about. Uh, these have all have been well documented, though, and if you're interested, I encourage you to look up and read more about that. Full books have been written about the Naperville train disaster, in fact. So what we will discuss, derailments, collisions, and the like in Wheaton, Glen Ellen, Winfield, Warrenville, in the area that's now Carroll Stream. Tried to keep it to a six-mile radius or so from 
downtown Wheaton. So I wanted to give a very brief history of uh, railroading in Wheaton. So Chicago is the nation's rail capital, and the Wheaton area has, however you want to count it, uh, or one way to count it, there have been five rail lines in the broader Wheaton area over the years. Five lines? So take a look. The first one is the old Galena and Chicago Union. That became the Chicago Northwestern, and now the Union Pacific. If you look here in the upper left-hand corner, you'll see an example of a steam, the kind of steam locomotive that came through town. Uh, upper center is steam locomotive later for the Chicago and Northwestern. Um, and then on the lower left-hand corner, that's Chicago and Northwestern Heritage Unit that Metra operates. In the lower center, that's the Southern Pacific Heritage Unit that comes through Wheaton sometimes on freight trains. L uh, right hand photograph there, I took that out a commuter, a Metra train that's a Union Pacific Freight at College Avenue. Second railroad is the Illinois Central. They uh, put a line in, uh, their uh, subsidiary of the Chicago Madison and Northern put a line in in 1887 and 1888. That became the Illinois Central then, the Illinois Central Gulf, then the Chicago Central and Pacific, then the Illinois Central again, and now the Canadian National. That's a lot of changes. You'll see an Illinois Central steam locomotive there on the left. The ICG operated in the 70s and 80s. The upper right-hand corner is the Chicago Central and Pacific. And the lower right-hand corner is a Canadian National locomotive at Gary Avenue. I know because I took that at 12.35 p.m. today. <laughs> The third railroad is the Chicago Great Western, which those of you old timers here, and I definitely see a few old timers here, will remember the Great Western going through Southern Carroll Stream. It was called Gretna back then. Uh, the line was built in 1887. It was abandoned in 1991. I know this because if you look at the article in the far right, I wrote the article for the Daily Journal here in Wheaton about the abandonment of the line. That is the final run in June of 1991. It's now a bike path. If you look in the lower center, uh, I also took that photograph. That is a Union Pacific locomotive operating on some of the only remaining pieces of the Great Western. There are a couple of small remnants in St. Charles and in West Chicago. The other three photographs are all at Gretna of old Chicago Great Western trains operating. Uh, the fourth uh, railroad that's operated in the Chicago area is the Chicago Roar and Elgin, originally named the AENC. You see a number of pictures here that I tried to take that I tried to provide all from Wheaton. If you look in the up lower left-hand corner there, you see the bridge over the Chicago Northwestern, now the Union Pacific, obviously the station in downtown Wheaton. Upper center, you see Weesbrook Road. Upper right-hand corner, you see the shops uh, where the police station is now. And lower right-hand corner and lower center, you see the Chicago Golf Club station that the railroad had. And the fifth railroad in Wheaton, the Wheaton Sanitary District, actually briefly built and operated a private and purpose-built narrow-gauge railroad north from the Chicago Roar and Elgin, it paralleled, the, the right-of-way of the Roar and Elgin that paralleled Weesbrook Road. This line went up now what is now Stonebridge Trail during the construction of the district's facility in 1926. So that's actually it paralleling the private road there that is now Stonebridge Trail. So this operated this toted gravel to the sanitary district's plant. It was a temporary railroad and it was removed once the plant was completed. So I'll be referring to all of these different railroads using abbreviations like the CNNW, the CGW, the CANE, and the IC or the ICG. So why do we have so many rail lines in the broader Wheaton area? Well, trains were the only way to move people and freight around in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, but also Wheaton was an agricultural community and local trains could collect and ship items uh, harvested by Wheaton's farmers, but also Chicago is a national rail hub, so you had spokes extending out from the city in all directions. That's why there have been so many main lines extending out from, the Wheaton, uh, from Chicago through towns like Wheaton. So I'm going to talk a little bit about known unknowns. I don't know when Wheaton's first train wreck occurred. Part of the reason why is Wheaton's newspapers are not archived before 1885. So the first railroad came through town in 1849. 36 years, I, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind there were wrecks and crashes in those first 36 years. Railroading was really primitive. <clears throat> Where were there other wrecks? President-elect Franklin Pierce in 1853, he was on a train that derailed in Massachusetts. It killed his son. And then in April of 1853, there was a 
largely forgotten rail disaster on the south side of Chicago in a dark marshy area that's now part of Chicago proper, but it wasn't back then. It's an area called Grand Crossing. Killed 21 people when two passenger trains collided. In the 1800s, trains rammed into other trains all the time. They jumped the track a lot. You had absolutely no technology, and you had safety controls that were basically non-existent. A, 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 tra a train would have a flag man jump out off the back and wave a, uh, a flag to keep the, the, the second train from ramming into the first one. Where we first have knowledge of crashes in Wheaton is 1887. So some of these images are hard to find, but starting in the 1880s, the local news media reported on wrecks in both Glen Ellen and in Wheaton. So in 1887, the same steam locomotive that you see here rammed twice into another Chicago Northwestern train in front of Wheaton's rail depot. Now this is an early depot. This is before the one that you all know it is at Cosley Zoo. So let's talk about what happened. So the first time it happened, the train was going westbound and it slammed into a stopped way freight. A way freight is a local freight, so one picking up items along the line. So the damage was described as slight. Three weeks later, it was much more destructive. This time, that same locomotive was coming east from what's now West Chicago when it, quote, came round the curve by the old hay barn at all speed, and it was impossible to stop the heavy train. It plowed into the caboose, set its rear end squarely on her lap, her being the locomotive, pressed forward until the cow catcher could no longer plow the ties. A caboose and three boxcars were a total wreck. Kindling wood was plenty, <laughs> and a part of the depot platform was moved up to the site for the contemplated new depot. Okay, the contemplated new depot is the one you all see today at Cosley Zoo. One boxcar was so surprised, I didn't know boxcars had feelings, uh, <laughs> that she took flight and she tried to alight on top of the depot, but a telegraph pole and the many wires prevented a sad catastrophe to the adjacent building. Guess which noted Wheatonite was in that adjacent building? None other than Albert H. Gary, a DuPage County judge, and he was the city's future mayor. Judge Gary was meditating over some 20 or so probate and chancery cases, and he had a very narrow escape. So I, I mentioned a second ago about a flagman not being out. That's exactly what happened here. There was negligence. The conductor uh, did not put a flagman out, and so the conductor of the eastbound freight train from West Chicago had been notified. Uh, he was told, hey, the train uh, in Wheaton is running 15 minutes late, so the second train should have been on the lookout and not running so fast. The local newspaper said it probably would have been cheaper for the railroad to have lost the depot than to replace the damaged rolling stock. So the paper thought this would have been great, just destroy the depot and we get a new one. This is a rendering of what, the, what Wheaton's uh, depot at that time looked like. So then in 1891, there were two collisions in the same month in Glen Ellen, then known as Prospect Park. So you had a lot of grand Travel trains back then, they provided ballast. So in 18, uh, October of 1891, a gravel train ran into a local freight and threw the way car and, and two loaded freight cars off the track, completely demolished them. Okay, no injuries and the wreck wasn't cleared until that night, but it was again the fault of carelessness of a brakeman for not flagging the train. But a more minor wreck happened 11 days later in Glen Ellen when a gravel train again rammed a local freight. This one was heading for Elgin. And again, it was a switch tender being careless. Two cars were ditched. So following here, we had more rear end crashes, this time in Winfield. And this time it was a passenger train from Clinton, Iowa was pulling into Winfield when its brakes failed. So the train went past the Winfield station a good bit, and then it decided to back up to the station. Now this sounds like a bad idea, right? So it backed up to the station and a freight train that had left West Chicago right after the passenger train had, rounded the curve and it was under full headway, it crashed into the passenger train. How no one was killed, I have no idea, but several were hurt, the freight locomotive was badly damaged, and the tr two rear passenger coaches were thrown to one side. I only wish I had photos of some of these, and I don't. We're going to get to photos soon. Um, in February of 1895, we had what may have been the worst wreck in the town up to that point. Okay, This one, you had a couple of Chicago Northwestern freight cars derailed, uh, that a car loaded with hogs was tipped over, and it killed a few. Another 
another article in the same issue said actually six cars were derailed, considerable livestock were killed, the depot platform was badly torn up and more or less destroyed or badly damaged. No one was blamed for the wreck, but they said it was a broken brake beam on the locomotive. All right, so now we're heading into the 20th century now. We're going to go up to Cloverdale, which is near Carroll Stream, or, or now Carroll Stream. There was a rear-end collision in February of 1903. So in, uh, two Illinois Central freight trains, both carrying livestock, collided in Cloverdale right by Geary Avenue and Army Trail Road. Two people were killed, 11 people were injured. You had an eastbound freight train crashing into another slower moving train's caboose, which had been filled with a, uh, it was a caboose full of stockmen coming from Iowa to Chicago to the stockyards. A fire ignited and it consumed the caboose and it consumed five cars of livestock were killed. One fireman and one stockman were the people killed. You see here the news coverage of it. It was in the Chicago Tribune and in the local paper as well. It was thick fog. This gentleman in the front row is absolutely correct. And a very similar, eerily similar wreck had happened in La Fox, west of Geneva, just the prior week. The Wheaton, Illinois newspaper said it was a terrible sight. Uh, the cattle dead and dying were piled in heaps over the prairie, and the moans of the injured beasts mingled with those of the suffering men. Newspapers were very literary back then. <laughs> All right, so let's head to 1905. I promise you we're going to get some photos soon. So in December of 1905, you had an eastbound CNNW passenger train left West Chicago, headed for Winfield, and went over the bridge over the DuPage River just west of Winfield. You all know where this is. The train had to follow a slow order over the bridge, so it, it took its speed down to 40 miles an hour. As it crossed the bridge to round the curve, the front wheels of the steam engine's tender left the tracks. Seconds later, the locomotive toppled over over, killing the engineer. He was on his first trip on this run. He was, he was pinned under the locomotive. The fireman crawled from the wreck, and he was able to save himself from being scalded to death from escaping steam. The entire train jumped the tracks. The locomotive left the tracks and actually did a 180. The tender then left the tracks to the south. All the rest of the train left the tracks as well, but stayed upright. Incredibly, none of the passengers were hurt. And then one day later, Later, a freight train stock car derailed in Winfield and fell over on the depot platform. These things happened a lot back then. I only know about the ones that are covered. So here's the local coverage of Winfield's wrecks. So now in a fairly horrifying thing that happened in Warrenville on the Aurora branch of the Chicago Aurora Elgin in October of 1913, a work train carrying a crane left Wheaton and headed southwest. Just past the Warrenville station, a gear and an axle, a gear wheel I mean to say, and an axle weighing about 1,500 pounds became detached from the crane and fell to the track. The work crew didn't notice this. So 15 minutes later, this seems like a bad idea, doesn't it? 15 minutes later, a two-car CA&E train left Wheaton down the Aurora branch. It had no passengers. They were just deadheading two crew members and the train to Aurora in advance of the morning rush hour. So it was still dark. The second train crashed into the steel casing, this gear wheel and this axle. The impact threw the front car on the tracks and it landed on its side. The rear car was pulled partly from the track and came to rest inclined at a sharp angle. The conductor of the first car was killed as he jumped from the train and the train rolled over him. Other crew members were not seriously hurt. This is one of the, if not the most, horrific uh, crash that the CA&E had in all of its 60 years of operating in the Wheaton area, amazingly. We'll talk more about that at the end. Um, but I want to shift here to talk about, I want to move now into World War II years. So the photograph that I showed you at the very beginning, uh, I'm going to show, no, I'm sorry, I'm almost that's 1945. Hang on. So I want to go to 1941 first. Forgive me. Wheaton saw its first wreck in many years when something called a journal box, that actually holds an axle bearing. It was burned off a set of wheels on a freight train in the middle of the night in 1941, and it was in the middle of a 70-car eastbound CNNW freight train. It happened right in downtown Wheaton. 25 boxcars derailed between North Scott Street and North Chase Street. Very
very close to where we're all located right now. Freight cars twisted across all three sets of tracks in Wheaton. There were no injuries or fatalities, and the brunt of the wreckage was spread across the Washington Street crossing. So here are some photos. I admit these are grainy photos, but if you look here, you see the Wheaton Daily Journal's coverage of this here, uh, and then you see there what they were trying to do in terms of clearing the rails so you can move, especially commuter trains through. In the lower right-hand corner, you actually see that burned off journal box. You see how the, it's supposed to hold the trucks or the wheels together, and that obviously wasn't the case there, and that sparked the entire derailment. So the Daily Journal wrote that the wreck, quote, freed a large number of cattle bound for the stockyards. Most were corralled, but uh, some half dozen escaped to roam the city streets. Not quite the run of the bulls, but something comical, right? No steers were killed in the wreck, but workers were trying to get the cattle trapped in a derailed freight car. It was on its side. They tried to get them to walk the plank into waiting trucks. It was a uh, quite a, 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 a difficult burden to make that happen. And then the Daily Journal reported that split open refrigerator cars gave rise to hopes of many spectators that meat contained in the cars might be given away or sold at, low, at a low figure. No luck, a private concern that salvaged this kind of thing bought two loads of the meat and the meat in the best condition was reloaded and shipped. So the south, and which is the westbound track, was cleared about four hours later in time for the morning rush hour and the center track was opened later that day for freight service. It was a mess. So now I'm going to move forward. This is the one that showed the Carlson building. This is also a wreck that happened very close to where we are right now. So in June 1945, a westbound CNNW freight train heading for Clinton, Iowa on the Mississippi River suffered a derailment at the Cross Street crossing. Fourteen cars left the tracks and piled up at the crossing. Now, blessedly, there were no injuries, but it occurred. You're going to start to see this as a theme after the trucks or the wheels of one freight car had derailed as far back as College Avenue and they were dragging along the wooden ties. They then struck a derail bar at a switch just east of Cross Street. There actually used to be a switch and actually a siding just east of Cross Street, really close to where the uh, where the um, where the courthouse, the old courthouse is. So this is a photo here. Uh, you see freight cars strewn right there at the Cross Street crossing, right in front of the old Carlson uh, hardware store there. The wreck tied up commuter service for five hours until service resumed. The Daily Journal reported that thousands of spectators from Wheaton and nearby towns crowded front streets to watch the wrecking crews at work. About a day later, railroad workers had gotten the westbound track open for service. Next up, let's go to 1950 in Gretna. This is one of the more comical derailments in Wheaton area history. A seven-car Chicago Great Western wrecking train derailed when it was en route to another wreck. <laughs> it was a derrick or a wrecking crane. It and three flat cars left the track in the middle of the night. It was about 100 feet west of where Main Street, now Schmaley Road, crossed the Great Western tracks. No one was injured, but I'll give you a photo here of what was going on here. So the wrecker had been heading for a 10-car derailment on the Great Western up in Stockton, Stockton, Illinois, out by Rockford. And the cause was not initially determined, uh, but it was assumed to be a broken journal or a broken wheel. And a wrecking crew from another railroad, the Elgin Gillette Eastern, showed up to clear the wreckage. We don't know if this is the worst wreckage in Gretna history. It may well be. There were some other disasters in Gretna, including a the, entire, the, the, the station there at the time burned to the ground in 1905. But in terms of derailments, I haven't found a worse one than this one. So now moving into 19, uh, a little bit later in 1950, Glen Ellen had a, um, quite a plume of flames in September of 1950 when an eastbound Chicago Northwestern freight train derailed just after clearing a westbound freight. Three tank cars carrying oil or propane gas exploded and burned. Flames shot 200 feet in the air, according to news accounts. That's roughly the height of the Wheaton Center off, uh, apartment building, to give you some idea. It was just east of downtown 
downtown Glen Ellen near where Ellenwood Drive and Midway Park come together. Take a look at this photograph here from the Chicago Tribune. This is horrific. And you see the coverage there in the Daily Journal as well. So it drew more than 5,000 spectators in September of 1950. It was attributed to a parted coupling pin that separated the last 20 cars of the train. And luckily the engineer and the conductor were not hurt and they were able to open the westbound track less than 10 hours later. But uh, there, there often are complications in these situations. So the next night, gas leaking from a tank car saturated through the railroad roadbed. And when a worker threw a flare off to the side, it started a new fire that firefighters had to ex extinguish. They didn't get all of the wreckage removed until five days after the derailment. All right, let's head back to Wheaton here. Could this be Wheaton's most famous train wreck? It's the one that people talk about the most, and I bet a decent number of you in this room actually remember. In June of 1956, two Chicago Northwestern freight trains collided. There are lots of photographs of this one. This is just west of the Chicago Aurora to Elgin Bridge, now the Prairie Path Bridge over the CNNW. This was on June 8, 1956. You had an eastbound Chicago Northwestern freight train leave the tracks, and it rammed into the side of a passing westbound freight train. Many freight cars toppled over the embankment onto Manchester Road, others telescoped onto the right of way, and some scattered in the F.E. Wheaton lumber yard. Sadly, a hobo, a transient who was stealing a ride on one of the trains, perished in the wreck. And then, interestingly enough, the assistant division engineer of, of the railroad, he had a heart attack after working all night to clear the wreckage, believe it or not. Some of these photos are just, I, I, I could look at these all day long. This overhead photo here, really, it, these look like kids' toys here, don't they? Yeah. And then you see here in the middle here, uh, you actually see this is some produce here in a Pacific Fruit Express Union Pacific uh, refrigerated car there. Um, and then again, you see it says here, man killed in 57 car freight wreck. It's an astonishing number of cars left the tracks. And if you look here, these photos frequently are shared on Facebook. Uh, and these are just fascinating to get a look at what the uh, salvage and cleanup people had to deal with. Really incredible. And again, I know I said this a moment ago, but not only were an astonishing 57 freight cars strewn about, but one of them actually knocked out a telephone cable serving Winfield, which knocked 575 phones out of service. You also had no freighter passenger service through Wheaton at all. So some commuters had to shift to the Aurora and Elgin. All three tracks were blocked. Rails and ties were torn out in sections. Their initial read was that a journal had broken. Again, one of these items that holds the trucks together, the uh, you know, a, a railroad car's wheels, and it sparked the derailment in the eastbound train. One neighbor told the Daily Journal that he was awakened by what he thought was a series of, quote, ammo dumps blowing up. 1956 wasn't that long after after World War II, so ammo dumps were fresh in people's minds. Now, I'd like to know how many of you remember this next wreck. In February of 1960, there was a derailment of a train carrying Navy bombs in Wheaton. Does anyone remember this? This is in downtown Wheaton in the uh, 100 block of West Front Street. February of 1960, an eastbound Chicago Northwestern freight train derailed on the center track opposite the commuter station. That's the one that you see now on Front Street between Main and Hale that is used for retail space now. It was stationed from 1911 until 1976. But what happened was you had some naval bombs, a 46-ton load of these. They apparently were not equipped with warheads, thankfully enough, but people didn't know that at first. So a gondola car was right in front of the boxcar with the bombs. The gondola car derailed at the Hale Street crossing. These pictures are grainy, it's true, so it's kind of hard to see entirely all of what's going on in some of these photos, and forgive me for that. This is just the best that I was able to do with photos from microfilm. But uh, you see this headline on the far right there. It talks about this derailment par periling, uh, as in putting in peril, the Wheaton business area here. The cause of the derailment turned out to be a hot journal box that burned through the gondola car's axle. No one was injured, but it really gave people in town one heck of a scare. 
All right, so we're in the 1960s, aren't we? So let's go back up to Cloverdale. I promised I wouldn't include rail and vehicle collisions, but this one is my one exception. In June of 1966, up at the Gary Avenue crossing in Cloverdale, where I was today, an eastbound Illinois Central passenger train was traveling at 65 miles an hour through DuPage County from Waterloo, Iowa. It was called the Land O Corn train. I have never heard of this before. I did this uh, this uh, presentation, the Land O Corn train. It struck a cement mixer at the Gary Avenue crossing. The truck driver was killed. Five people were injured, including the engineer and the fireman. Again, this is June of 1966. Take a look at some of these photos. I talked earlier about looking like a kid's toy train set for the 1956 wreck. Take a look at this here. I mean, this is, you see the two locomotives off the tracks there. Goes to show you that uh, many times a when a train hits it's a vehicle, the train doesn't leave the track. The vehicle ends up worse for wear, the train less so. Here, a cement mixer was big enough, heavy enough to actually knock this passenger train's locomotives and several cars off the tracks. Now, I have some color photos of this wreck as well, but you can see actually these are some passenger cars there. This was pre-Amtrak, so the Illinois Central still operated its own cars with its own liveries, so to speak, its own colors as well. But if you look here, these color photos might give you a better idea of what was going on there. There's one of the two locomotives off the track as well. And then behind it are several, uh, there was a baggage car and several, they called them non-passenger cars, which is a fancy way of calling them freight cars that were included in this train. Three plumbers were having lunch at a restaurant at Gary Avenue and Army Trail Road. They rushed to the scene. They worked to free the engineer and the fireman from the train's derailed locomotive, which was on its side. So why did the cement mixer operator not see or hear the train? The county sheriff said it was, the truck was driven from a ready-mix concrete plant just south of the crossing. And the truck's driver was following a shortcut, taking them directly to the crossing instead of to Gary Avenue. So a driver on the shortcut could not easily see the flashing lights at the crossing. And again, this passenger train was going 65 miles an hour. All of the cars on the train jumped the track, including both locomotives, a baggage car, and two freight cars. All right, so I want you to remember the corner of Gary Avenue and Army Trail Road. We're gonna come back to that, okay? But first, in downtown Glen Ellen, uh, there was a, a minor derailment in December of 1971. This may be the most benign derailment Railment we're going to talk about tonight. A freight car on the evening of December 3rd, 1971, a freight car on an eastbound CNW freight train lost a wheel and started tearing up both the railroad tracks and the railroad bed. This was just east of Park Boulevard near downtown Glen Ellen, so very close to Glenbard West High School. This one was more mild than most. It delayed commuter trains, but the timing was good. It happened on a Friday night, so it was cleared up by the next morning, and it got very minimal media coverage. I found this citation from the Glen Ellen News, and then on the lower right-hand corner, that's from the Chicago Tribune. The local Wheaton papers didn't even bother covering the derailment. Should give you some idea how minor it was. Did I mention the corner of Gary Avenue and Army Trail Road in Cloverdale? So in 1975, an eastbound 90 car Illinois Central Gulf freight train was heading for freight yards in the south suburbs. It crossed the Army Trail Road crossing in Cloverdale. The rear part of the train reportedly started started swaying back and forth before about 10 freight cars derailed. News accounts suggested that the empty cars were swaying. They created momentum that pulled heavier freight cars loaded with auto parts off the tracks. So here's some news coverage of it. You can see a caboose. This is back in the days when trains still had cabooses. So you can see this Illinois Central caboose there. It's actually an Illinois Central Gulf by this point, but they still call it in the paper the IC. But you see workmen here trying to repair the tracks after the wreck, but you can see the derailed, uh, the derailed caboose there as well. Um, rail safety measures prevented this from being worse because the first car that left the tracks triggered an automatic uncoupling device that permitted the first 80 or so cars to immediately detach from the derailment. So as you can see, railroad safety was improving pretty meaningfully from earlier in this presentation. So now I want to get to the one of the most infamous wrecks in the Wheaton and Glen Ellen history. That is the Chicago and Northwestern's freight wreck on the two towns border in May of 1976. How many of you remember this one? <laughs> 
I thought many of you would. I, I do as well. It happened uh, very early in the morning on a Sunday morning in May of 1976. You had two eastbound freight trains going on at adjacent tracks in the same direction and it was on the broad curve between Wheaton and Glen Ellen. One had 43 loaded box cars, the other had 62 cars, 36 of which were loaded. So one was going about 50 miles an hour, the other was going about 40 miles an hour. The faster one on the center track derailed after it almost completely had passed the first one. And so its derailment then hit, you know, hit the, it, the cars, it hit cars that were pulled off the track in the derailment. So what happened was the first train derailed first and then the second train derailed as a result. Part of the first train was dragged three or four blocks. It ripped up tracks. Residents in the area said it sounded like a loud screech and a tremendous roar. The major issue, though, wasn't even the derailment. Thankfully, no one was killed in this wreck. However, 15,000 gallons of, of toxic ammonia were released from a 129-ton tank car, and that forced the evacuation of a huge area. So if you look here, this made the front page of the Chicago Tribune. Wheaton's own David Young actually wrote this article here. You can see the Chicago Northwestern locomotive on one of the trains there. Sideways on the track, you see a number of boxcars. But the real issue was the toxic gas leak. And so thankfully, again, there were no fatalities here. But the real issue, as you see in the upper right-hand corner there, was the suburbs were fighting off a horrific gas peril. And numerous workmen involved in cleaning up this wreck actually did inhale some, you know, had uh, suffer from toxic inhalation of ammonia. So it was also a tremendous mess. So what happened was the city of Wheaton, to my knowledge, didn't evacuate anyone, but Glen Ellen evacuated everyone living between Pennsylvania Avenue, which is College Avenue, Hawthorne Avenue, and Western Avenue, and the village limits. Glendale Heights actually evacuated some people in southern Glendale Heights as well because the ammonia cloud started drifting to the north North toward Glendale Heights. One of the more interesting things that happened, several freight cars smashed through the brick wall in front of the St. Moritz apartment complex on Pennsylvania Avenue, and yes, one freight car fell into the complex's swimming pool. I drove over there the other day, and there is no swimming pool at that apartment complex any longer. It's a parking area now. So some of the tracks were actually cleared by the next day, believe it or not. So commuter service could resume. You actually see commuter service resuming here. This is what the old Chicago Northwestern uh, commuter cars used to look like as well. And you see in the center here, the Daily Journal noted that they worked all night to get the trains running by morning. This here on the uh, right-hand side is a fairly grainy image of, of the cleanup work in process. I want to talk just a little bit more about this because it was just an environmental disaster. So both diesel fuel from the locomotives and ammonia, they flowed into Glen Ellen's storm sewer system, which flows into what? Lake Ellen, okay? So it killed almost all the fish in Lake Ellen. State Conservation Department said it would take two years before fishing could resume in the lake. In the end, 14 people were injured from the wreck. Seven people, it was, it was gas inhalation. You had some firefighters uh, needed to be treated as well and several railroad workers. I'd never heard this before I worked on this presentation. Three people were arrested for allegedly looting items strewn from the wreck, including clothing and a TV set. Looting in Glen Ellen, I've never heard of such a thing. <laughs> So the wreck in April 1977 was blamed on substandard track and the fact that the engineer of the first train that derailed was operating at too high of a speed for the condition of the track. So remember I said he was going 50 miles an hour. One problem that the railroads had, and we'll talk more about this at the very end, uh, was just poor condition of their physical plants. And so this is, these were track you couldn't go that fast and they weren't kept up very well. So now we're going to head to 1978 and we're going to go right back to Army Trail Road and Gary Avenue. So in September of 1978, an eastbound Illinois Central Gulf freight, freight train was carrying lumber and grain. It was going 40 miles an hour through Cloverdale. The intersection of Army Trail Road and Gary Avenue, 17 of its 83 cars derailed as they passed over a switch. It actually damaged four cars waiting at the railroad crossing. Four people suffered minor injuries. Five 
500 feet of track were mangled and one maintenance building at that intersection was heavily damaged. Here is a color photograph of what happened to give you some idea. Now it wasn't as built up in 1978 as it is today. You didn't have Stratford Square Mall yet. You did have St. Isidore's Church, but in general that intersection was fairly uh, rural as you see how it looks here. But you see what kind of wreck uh, and mess here you see with the boxcar strewn. I want to show a few more photos of this as well from the Daily Journal. This is actually a car that was damaged here on the left. You see a lot of the cleanup that's going on and you see uh, they were able to get a, a phone line in the upper right hand corner to the maintenance building that was damaged. And then you see some trucks there, some wheels from a train in the lower right hand corner there. The derailment's cause wasn't immediately obvious. The spokesman for the Illinois Central Gulf Railroad, Bob O'Brien, he told the Chicago Tribune, he said, there's an awful lot of shrapnel out there that we're going to have to look at to see what happened. The train was carrying wallboard and tallow, as well as flour and corn. Authorities feared for three hours that the train was carrying hazardous materials. The one car they were worried about was carrying flour, actually, so not too harmful. All right, so this is getting ridiculous. In January of 1985, there was another derailment in Cloverdale, incredibly. In January of 1985, a slow-moving 54-car eastbound Illinois Central Gulf train from Freeport, Illinois, left the tracks at 7 a.m. that morning, just east of Gary Avenue. So one of the eyewitnesses was the principal of Black Hawk Elementary School in Glendale Heights, and he was driving his wife to work. His wife Elaine worked at J Stream School in Carroll Stream. Does anyone know the Sagers at all? Anyone? So they were stopped in their car. They're headed south on Gary. They noticed a freight car rocking violently. Right after that, 14 cars left the tracks. You'll see some pictures here. This is one of those. You see several freight cars. One of them is a Union Pacific freight car with the ironic tagline we can handle it on there. And then if you see in the right hand corner, again, I, I know I mentioned before, Trains used to have cabooses. It's kind of sad that they don't now. But you can see what kind of cleanup and wreckage and torn track and ties the railroad cleanup people had to deal with. There was actually a tank car that was loaded with granulated sulfur. It was the first freight car to derail. The derailment didn't actually block Gary Avenue. They said luckily they got the train across Gary Avenue without hitting any cars. So the question I asked is why are there so many derailments in Cloverdale over the years? Uh, one can assume that the Illinois Central Line from Chicago to Freeport and then out to Galena was significantly under maintained from the 1960s through the 1980s. All right, so what happened next? Incredibly, there have been no derailments, wrecks, or crashes in Wheaton after 1985 that I've been able to find. Part of the reason is we have fewer rail lines than we once did, right? The Aurora and Elgin was abandoned in the early 1960s. The old Great Western had its final run in 1991. Those abandonments removed from the network lines that were at risk from poor maintenance. The Canadian National now owns the old IC line through Cloverdale. The Canadian National has a reputation for stellar rail maintenance. The Union Pacific also has made significant investments in the former Chicago Northwestern triple track maintenance line through downtown Wheaton and in general railroads just do a much better job today maintaining their physical plant. So to wrap up, what I'd like to say is the Wheaton area has had a significant number of train wrecks, collisions, and other rail mishaps over the past 135 years, and no doubt for the entire nearly 175 years that we've had rail lines in our town. So blessedly, we have not had some of the horrible tragedies here in our community that have taken place in other towns, including some towns that aren't that far away from us. With the railroad companies doing a better job than ever of keeping their equipment and rail lines in good shape, and with technology preventing much of the aspects of human error that used to cause problems on railroad lines, the likelihood of future train wrecks in our area certainly is low. Even so, if you want to see a wreck sometime, it should be obvious that the place to go <laughs> is the corner of Gary Avenue and Army Trail Road. I'm, I want to say thank you and ask for questions, but before I do, I, I, someone is going to ask why we don't have more Chicago and Aurora, Aurora and Elgin wrecks. The answer is there were wrecks on the Chicago Aurora and Elgin they just weren't in Wheaton. So this one here on the left-hand corner was in the 1920s. It took place in Elmhurst. 24 people were hurt. 
The one on the right there is actually from the 1950s, and you can see in the Chicago Tribune, a Chicago or an Elgin car off the tracks there. Uh, that's in Forest Park, uh, where the Des Plaines Avenue stop is. So the Roar and Elgin did have wrecks, and amazingly, the ones that I've been able to find were not in Wheaton. Now, it had its shops in Wheaton, so it's not impossible to imagine that there would have been derailments in the shops, but these did not attract news attention. So with that, I'd like to say thank you all and I'd be willing to have uh, to, to take some questions if you have any. Thank you. Thank you so I, I do have a mic here, uh, and it would be helpful uh, to be able to hear the questions. So raise your hand. I'll do my best to get it to you, or you can just talk really loud. so not surprising. Amtrak, Amtrak trains seem like they have collisions with vehicles all the time. The real issue, the fault is always on the car driver. It's never on the, the fault of the train. Everyone knows. And there, and there were no lights or any. Well, it's also true there are some crossings in rural areas that don't have gates, crossing gates. Luckily, we have crossing gates and flashing lights here in Wheaton, but it is also true that uh, people still go around, you know, don't look both ways and go around the, uh, the gates left and right. That is just a sad, sad fact. Mm -hmm. Yes? So I'm glad there hasn't been a disaster since 1985 and that the safety is so much better. Is it true that the potential for disaster is actually very great? as there is uh, a large amount of toxic waste and even nuclear waste that rolls through the area uh, on a regular basis. That is absolutely correct. Yeah, there's no question about it. We saw the Quebec disaster as well several years ago. There is no question. We have an enormous amount of freight of all kinds, including toxic chemicals, toxic waste. I don't know about nuclear waste, but it certainly wouldn't surprise me. Uh, and the Union Pacific moves an enormous amount of freight through downtown Wheaton. At any time, we could have something happen similar to what happened in Ohio. And so there is no question that it, it's not an if, but a one. Not necessarily for Wheaton, but certainly in the Chicago area. The Chicago area has been really fortunate that we haven't had a disaster on par with what happened in Quebec. Do you have information? Is information available on the potential for uh, response to disaster? should something like that happen? That is a great question. I don't know. I assume uh, DuPage County has a lot of uh, emergency uh, management uh, uh, abilities and functions, so I would assume that's something that they actually do drills on, but it's hard to know. I think when you saw what happened in Ohio, it's just it, the Norfolk Southern wreck just showed, I don't know that you can ever be fully prepared for something like that. I mean, there's some thought that the property values in that town in Ohio are near zero. No one will ever want to buy a house in that community and uh, so uh, the more devastating the wreck the more the, the more questions there would be about the viability of a community yes yes you mentioned um, the uh, name train land corner yes yeah uh, Amtrak actually ran a name train by that uh, it actually went on IC tracks and there was a station in uh, Elmhurst uh, right at York Road the south of uh, I knew that Amtrak had that line. I didn't realize they called it Lando Corn. There's actually been some talk about resuming service now out to, out to Rockford. Um, but yeah, that's, I think that's, that Lando Corn is just a, it's, it's a very Iowa sounding type name for sure. <laughs> I was there when the train wreck on Manchester Road, a huge one, and we were on the, we was called the Red Ridge, and we just watched from up there. But a lot of the cars had fruit in it that was just splayed all over the place. What is the law about 
grabbing stuff. <laughs> we did not do it. We stayed on the bridge, but people were grabbing oranges and apples. And <laughs> that is a wonderful question. So I'm, I am not trained as a lawyer, uh, but I would say, I think in general, I think that's uh, ill-advised, I suspect. I suspect that uh, just based on on the looting arrest that took place in 1976, I suspect that that is uh, frowned upon by railroads. Yeah, they could use the truth. Well, that's a, that's also they true. All over the ground. Oh, I'm. There are a lot of cans of camel soup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and by the way, uh, whether it's Opitz or Elite Street, I really you're one of the people who I, I read the byline, not the headline. Thank so you. I Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I grew up near a roundhouse in the Great Northern and Sioux Line in Superior, Wisconsin. I now live next to the, court, uh, the old courthouse, and grandchildren like those trains a lot, and uh, more than I do going by. Uh, <laughs> but one of the things I noticed really is uh, two things. One was the great steam train, silver, whatever, came through a few years ago. With it packed along the way, it's still deep, raw, uh, people still love trains. And secondly, even though they're running back and forth, the trains seem water, things are safer, they really aren't that much different as far as how they work. They change diesel fuel, they make it electricity. It's an electric, big old electromotive thing that used to be made in Chicago. Uh, are there any real advances in rail that you see uh, other than the sure, sure. Yeah, no, the, the biggest advance I would say, based on what I've seen, uh, it takes fewer people. So you have fewer people in terms of crews on trains, and that can be good and bad. It's good for these companies' shareholders, it's good for their profit profitability ratios, which are called operating ratios. It's not necessarily as good from a safety stand standpoint, should there be a problem. But broadly, yeah, they're running longer freight trains than ever, and they're running them with fewer human beings. I, you know, the question one must ask, I don't know how far into the future we want to go, will there be driverless freight trains one day in the future? There certainly are in limited uh, mi mining, mi you know, near uh, uh, coal mines and on closed properties, there are driverless trains now. But in terms of on the, the national rail network, not yet. But that's the big change. Besides the safety, I think it's just, it's what I said in the presentation, that physical plants are better than ever. They're pristine, and so that's related into safety, but then there also are fewer people operating and monitoring these. There's just been uh, such a step function up in terms of tech, the technology that's used by the railroads. Yes? Yeah. Um, not counting uh, the train uh, pedestrian accidents that, that you said you were going to cover, have there been any notable uh, metro commuter rail derailments? Not, Ron, that's a great question. So in Wheaton, no. Um, and in, in fact, on Metro, where there have been derailments over the years, uh, and there haven't been many, but they've been on other lines, commuter rail lines that have been operated in the Chicago area. They have not been actually on the, the line that goes through our community, either before Metro took over in the 70s or after Metro took over. So incredibly, you know, yes, you're right about it. there have been a lot of train pedestrian incidents on Metro, but no, in terms of actual derailments? No, there haven't been any on this, which is called the Union Pacific West Line. There haven't been any. No. Okay, Were most train wrecks at the time steam locomotives? So steam, uh, that's a great, that's a wonderful question and I should have uh, dis discussed that further. Um, what happened was the, the rail uh, industry shifted from steam trains to diesel trains gradually throughout the 1940s and 1950s. So my talk, when I talked about anything up until about 1940, that would have been a steam train unless it was the electric railroad, the Chicago Roar and Elgin. Those were cars that operated entirely using an electric contact wire. However, after starting in the 1940s, diesel trains were became more and more the norm. And I think the last steam train was operated on the Chicago Northwestern in the 1950s on a regular basis. So that's a wonderful question. So everything you heard from the 1950 or 1940s and 50s on would have been diesel. Before that, would have been steam. Any other questions? I have a quick one. I don't need the microphone. Um, you talk about the Union Pacific Line. Are they at capacity? You hear about, you know, um, precision railroading, yes. yeah. all the stuff that goes along, you know, all like um, Joliet's like an inland port almost. 
Um, are our lines that run through at capacity for freight? That's a, a wonderful question. And the, the answer, I, I can't speak for the railroad, but I believe the answer is no. I think they actually can put more freight on the network than they have right than they are right now. Some of it has to do with the condition of the economy, and I'm not an economist, but just th when the economy is booming, the, the line tends to carry more freight. The other way you know it is by the number of trains you see parked along the line as well, P certainly between downtown Wheaton and downtown Winfield, between downtown Glen Ellen and downtown Lombard. Where you see trains parked in those locations, that tends to be at periods of very high capacity. I've seen less of that in the last year or two. Now, you know, so who can say for sure, but I'd be surprised. I would think if the UP had a representative here, they would say right away, the answer is absolutely, uh, we can put more traffic on, the, on, on this particular network right now. I don't know that the BNSF in Naperville would say that. They run a lot more movements on the line through Naperville than in Wheaton. But again, I'm, that's just my armchair conclusion. Okay. Um, the, the, the former CNNW West Line has dropped 10 trains a day since I believe, 2015 as a result of uh, coal fired power plants converting. So there's capacity yeah. right there. Thank you. I should have I should have noted that. Yeah. That's right. That's right. The, the 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 coal mines in Wyoming, the low sulfur coal, have been served by the Union Pacific and the Chicago Northwestern before that for now the last several decades, and that's absolutely right. With that demand for coal waning, you just don't have the volume of coal trains coming through town that you once did. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Thank you all.